is my daughters have always told the sound man wherever I pastor is during the song service, be sure to keep daddy turned down. And uh, they don't want to uh, hear me uh, in the congregation. We have a pretty large television ministry where I serve at in Knoxville, Tennessee. And they say, surely we don't want those people out there watching television to hear it. So I'm not much of a singer. Steve, but I appreciate your singing. It's so good tonight to see folks that, uh, that I've known through the years here in uh, Tifton, Georgia, and uh, to uh, reacquaint ourselves together. It's a joy to have you here this evening. It's a joy for me to be here tonight, to come and to share with you from the Word of God. Why don't you take your Bible tonight, and let's turn together, please, to the book of Acts in chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. I preached this morning primarily to the church, and I'm preaching tonight primarily to the church, but I believe tonight God would save you if you're here and you have a heart to hear and to listen. I believe that God will speak to you as well uh, this evening. Let's stand together to give reverence to the reading of God's Word. I want to speak tonight to you on the subject of a willing witness. A willing witness. In Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul is standing before King Agrippa and is given an answer for his life that is living, a testimony of a transformation that's taken place in his life when he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. He begins to share that in verse 13, and he says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and then which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou have, thou have seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, on whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Father in heaven, God, thank you tonight for the opportunity again to be here. Thank you for every person, God, tonight in this room, in the sound of my voice, that have come, Lord, here by divine providence. God, you brought us here to speak to our hearts and, God, to challenge our lives. And, God, I pray to change our lives. I pray, Father, tonight, if there's anyone here that's never been saved, that God tonight, they'll come and repent of their sins and receive Jesus Christ and be saved. And I pray, God, for those of us who know you as our personal Savior, that, God, you might stir our hearts tonight. God, you might send revival into our lives. That, God, we might be about the business, God, that you have called us to do, to honor and to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray tonight as your servant that you would empty me of self. God, you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. You would cleanse my heart. And that, God, you would speak through me and to me tonight. And, God, use me for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated. In your Bible, if you were to look over at Acts chapter 1, the top of the heading would say, in most Bibles, the Acts of the Apostles. Well, in the book of Acts, I don't think that's a proper title for the book of Acts. Now, I'm not questioning the authority of God's Word. But that that was not inspired. That was put there by man to try to identify the book. If you were to study the the book of Acts properly, I think, you would come to an understanding that it is not the Acts of the Apostles, but it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit as He works through the church and through believers who are submitted and surrendered to Him. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus said, When the Holy Ghost has come upon you, He will give you power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and indwelled the believers, indwelled the church, empowered them and enabled them to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. They began at Jerusalem, they went out into Judea, and in the uttermost parts of the world, into Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And the missionary, the the missionary, the preacher that God used to take that message out primarily to the world was the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, after he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And in the book of Acts, in 28 chapters of the book of Acts, what you have recorded is, you have the Acts of the Holy Spirit. 
how He works through people's lives and how the church, the people who are saved by the grace of God, are going into Jerusalem and they're witnessing, telling people about Jesus. They're going into Judea and they're telling people about Jesus. They're over in Samaria telling people about Jesus. They're down at Philippi telling people about Jesus. They're over at Antioch telling people about Jesus. They're going all over the world telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what you have recorded for us in the book of Acts is people going and telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of people today who have different ideals about the church. If you were to try tonight to define or describe what the church really is and what the responsibilities of the church are, what would you think those might be? What do you think the primary things that the church is to do, according to the Bible, what the church should be doing? Well, I submit to you tonight that there's basically three things that the church ought to be doing tonight. Number one is to worship. To worship. You see, we, we cannot do anything for the Lord Jesus Christ until, first of all, we have properly worshipped Him, brought ourselves into a right relationship with Him, honoring Him and glorifying Him. What I'm saying is our responsibility is, is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift Him up. And Jesus said if we lift up Him, He would draw all men to Himself. So the primary thing we do is we worship, we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, the thing we do is we're to work. Every person who is saved by the grace of God is to work inside the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to honor and glorify the Lord. And what we do by that is we, we educate the saints. We equip the saints for the ministry. And that's what our responsibility is as preachers and teachers of the Word of God. Paul said that he wrote to the church at Ephesus that the, that the pastor is, is God's gift to the church. And God's gift to the church to train you and, and to teach you and to equip you to do the work of the ministry. So what we do is we, we worship, we, we work, and then we witness. We tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. We expand and we extend and we evangelize uh, sinners. We reach out and try to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize that's important? Because if you don't do that, it won't be long till you don't have anybody to worship. If you don't do that, it won't be long till you won't have anybody to work. And so the responsibility is threefold. We work, we, we work, worship, we work, and we witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what I believe where Baptists fail the most at? It's not in our worship. I really don't believe we fail necessarily in our work. I think primarily where we fail is we fail to witness and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. I was amazed a few years ago to learn that 98% of our Southern Baptists never ever tell anybody about Jesus. Never ever witness person to tell anybody about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought to myself, why is that? Why is it that people do not obey the command of the Lord Jesus Christ to do what Jesus said that we ought to do? Now, we all enjoy worship. We all love to come together with the people of God, and we love to worship, and, and many people love to work. They like to get engaged in working for the Lord Jesus Christ. But we find that, that when we come to that thing of witnessing, that's where so many of us fail. And the Apostle Paul is teaching us here in the book of Acts, as Luke records for us, as he stands before King Agrippa, Paul just simply gives his testimony. Now, every one of us in this room tonight who have been saved by the grace of God, we have a testimony. You have a testimony tonight, and you can tell somebody what Jesus Christ has done for you. Now, let me show you Paul's testimony, and I want you to examine your testimony in light of Paul's testimony. Paul stood before King Agrippa. And he says to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, let me tell you about the change that took place in my life. Now, let me tell you something. You know why the world doesn't want to hear us tonight? You know why the world won't listen to us when the church goes out and tries to tell people about Jesus? One of the reasons is because they have not seen a significant change take place in our life. Paul, when he stood before King Agrippa, he said, King Agrippa, let me show you the change here that has taken place in my life. Over in verse 1 of chapter 26, then, then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. And he said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I, have a, I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things where I am accused of the Jews, especially because I uh, know thee to be an expert in all custom and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life, from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, 
which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now, you know what Paul's saying there? Paul is saying, as a standing for King Agrippa, King Agrippa, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ changed my life. How did he change you, Paul? He said he changed me from religion to reality. You see, that, that, that's a key right there. That's a key right there because, you see, I'll be one of the problems we have is we have a lot of people who are religion, who are religious, but do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a real, vital relationship. You know when people listen to us? When our relationship with Jesus Christ becomes real to us. When Jesus Christ becomes real to you, you will tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for you. Paul said, I want to tell you, Jesus Christ changed me from religion to reality. Paul said, I lived a Pharisee. I was a, of the strictness that there was never, ever more a religious person than Saul of Tarsus. But when Paul got saved, Jesus Christ changed his life. I had the privilege several years ago to start a church outside of uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, a little town called McMinnville, Tennessee. And we started in, in uh, broke ground. We started in June. We broke ground in August to build a building. We dedicated the building in November. And then on that November, when we were dedicating that building, uh, we had a week of Jubilee. And we had services every night. And there were people coming. Our first service, we had 427 people show up in that building. Very first service. A church that just started out with 50 people. We grew, and God blessed us in a great way. That Sunday night, in the invitation, had a young man sitting about two rows up from the back out on the inside aisle next to the wall. He got up, and he came down the aisle, and uh, he walked to the front, and... He took me by the hand, and I said to him, uh, what do you come for, and what's your name? He said, my name is Joey. And he said, I don't know why I came, but he said, preacher, I heard you talking about heaven, and I heard you talking about hell. I don't know where that's real or not. And I heard you talking about Jesus Christ, and I don't know where he's real or not. But I want to tell you, I'm in a desperate situation. I've been thinking about taking my life. My father took his life six months ago. I've been thinking about the very same thing. Is there anything worth living for? Now, I'll tell you what I could have done that night. I could have had a prayer with him and had him fill out a membership card and baptize him in a couple of weeks, and I had one other lost church member on the road. He wasn't ready to get saved that night, but God was working in his heart, and God was in the process of bringing him to the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, Joey, will you promise me that if God will speak to your heart and reveal himself to you, that he's real, would you come and would you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I said, will you promise me you'll be here every night of, the, of this week? He said, I promise you I'll be here. He came Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. On the last night of our services, about halfway through my sermon, he messed my sermon up. He got up and started walking down that aisle like he did on Sunday night. And I could hear him as he got down, halfway down the aisle, he was saying something. And as he got closer to the front, I could recognize what he was saying. He was saying, he's real, he's real, he's real. And he got to the front and I said, Joey, what do you mean? He said, preacher, I was out there today working on my farm. And I was digging trees, he owned a nursery. And I was digging trees and it was lunchtime. And God began to be, lay heavy upon my heart. And I looked up into heaven and I said, oh God, I believe you're real. And God, I believe you're real enough to come into my heart and forgive my sin. And God, save me. God, I want to know you. I want to know, God, that you're real. And he said, Preacher, Jesus Christ came into my heart and he saved me. I'm here tonight to tell you that Jesus Christ is real. That's what I'm talking about. When you tell people about Jesus Christ, Paul said, Jesus changed me from religion to reality. Not only that, but he said he changed me from expectation to experience. In verse 7 it says, Under which cause, which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come for which hope's sake, King Graham accused the Jews. You see, Paul said, I lived with, 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 the, with the expectation that one day that Jesus Christ was going to come. But he said, you know, I, I'm not living that way anymore with the expectation that Jesus Christ is going to come. Not the first time. Paul said, I'm living with the experience because Jesus Christ has come into my heart. And Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. You see, that's what happens to you when you get saved. That's what happens to you when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Oh, you have a hope, but you have a hope that is called a blessed assurance. You know that you know that you know that you've been saved because you've experienced salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then Paul said, not only that, Paul said, he has changed me from religion to reality. He has changed me from expectation to experience. He has changed me from persecution to proclamation. You see, there was never anybody ever in the history of the church that was an antagonist toward the church like Paul, like Saul of Tarsus. When Saul was saved on the road to Damascus, he had letters of authority to go and to take Christians and incarcerate them and bring them back and, and have them to be put to death for their stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. But when Paul got saved, Paul got saved all the way. Paul got, had a glorious experience of salvation. I know what people say sometimes. I remember when I was in a seminary. I know you don't believe it, but I went. When I was in the seminary, I heard a professor say in the seminary, what happened to Saul of Tarsus out there on the road to Damascus was that it was a noonday. And that hot Mideastern sun was shining down upon him out there on that road. And Saul had a heat stroke. I said to myself, if that were so, I would to God that every Baptist would have a heat stroke. Another definition, another thing he said happened was, he said, what happened to Paul? Paul had a tendency to have, have epilepsy. And what happened to Paul was, Paul got out there and Paul had a seizure. I come to the conclusion, if that were so, I would to God that every Baptist would have a fit. I would to God that every Baptist would be stricken and that they would get so excited about Jesus Christ. Listen, you know what happened to Paul? Paul had an old-time, old-fashioned salvation experience where Jesus Christ saved him and Jesus Christ changed his life. If Jesus Christ has saved you, he's changed your life. And if he's changed your life, you can tell somebody about it. You can tell somebody. You don't have to know everything in this Bible. You don't have to know every verse of Scripture in this book. You can tell somebody, let me tell you what Jesus Christ did for me. That's all it takes. Let me show you the second thing Paul said. Paul said, don't let me tell you about the change of my life. But Paul said, let me tell you about the commission of my life. Look down in verse 16 what Paul says. Paul says, here the Lord appeared to him. And he said, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared to thee for this purpose. Here's the reason. For this purpose. To make thee a minister. Now, that word minister is an interesting word. It is the same word in the New Testament Greek that we get our word deacon from. It is a word, it's the word diakonos. And it means a servant. Jesus said, Paul, I've appeared unto you for this purpose, to make thee a witness and to make you a servant. Of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto now unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Paul said, let me tell you something, King Agrippa. Jesus Christ has not only changed my life, but Jesus Christ has commissioned my life. Now, folks, every one of you in this room tonight who have been saved by the grace of God, you have a divine commission upon your life. Sometimes we make a mistake. People will come forward in our Baptist churches and they'll make a decision for Christ. They'll receive the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll tell them, have a seat. And they take us literal. And they sit, and they sit, and they sit, and they sit, and they sit. That's not what God's called you to do. God has called you to serve. Every single member of this church is called to be a servant. You can find your responsible place. You can plug in where God wants you to serve. And everybody can serve. I heard about an old boy that got saved in the church. It was kind of a cold church, kind of a formal church. He got saved in this church. And, and after a couple of weeks of, of being in the worship, he, he said to the pastor, Pastor, give me a job in the church. Give me a job. Pastor, this guy was, well... I mean, the light was on, but nobody was necessarily at home here. And, uh, but, but he was, he was saved. He was serious about serving. He said, Pastor, give me a job. Pastor said, I'll tell you, go pray about it. He went and prayed about it. About two weeks ago, he said, Pastor, he said, give me a job. I, Pastor, I want a job. I want to serve the Lord. Pastor, go pray about it. It's been about two more weeks. He said, Pastor, I'll give me a job. He said, Pastor, let me ask you a question, Pastor. Have we got any delinquent members in our church? 
And, and uh, have you got some stationery I can have with the church letterhead on it? Pastor thought to himself, well, that won't hurt nothing. And he gave him some stationery, gave him a list of members that hadn't been there in years, some, some, some old moss Baptists were backslidden, and he gave them those names about two weeks later. On a Sunday morning service, a young, prominent lawyer in town who was a member of the church, who hadn't been in several years, walked down the aisle on Sunday morning, took the pastor by the hand, and said he wanted to rededicate his life to the Lord and get right with God. And the pastor said, is there anything else you want to say? He said, yeah, I want to back up for the last two years. I've not been in church and pay my tithes and give my offerings to the Lord. Then the pastor got really excited then. He said, is there anything else you want to say? He said, yes. Pastor, tell your secretary. There's only one T in dirty and no C in skunk. <clears throat> See, everybody can do something. Everybody can serve. Maybe the nursery is where you're supposed to serve. Maybe the Sunday school is where you're supposed to serve. Maybe, maybe what Brother Steve was talking about this morning, maybe God's gifted you to be a vacation Bible school teacher. Maybe God's gifted you to do other things for the Lord. Every person saved by the grace of God has a gift to serve the Lord. Paul said, Jesus Christ saved me. He changed me. And He commissioned me to be a servant. Then said, He commissioned me to be a witness. Not only to serve, but to speak. Now listen to me. I know I've heard about everything that you could hear as far as excuses. People say, well, preacher, now, here's the kind of witness I am. Uh, I, I just witness by the way I live. I don't say anything. I just witness by the way I live. But you know what I've learned? I've learned that there are some Mormon folks that live better than what Baptists live. And they ain't saved. You know, you got you got to not only... Uh, Witness with your life. But you've got to witness with your lips. You've got to speak up. What if I came down here next week and I said to some of you men, take me out to your favorite fishing hole. And let's go out there and, 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 and anchor down and, and, and let's just sit there and influence fish. No, don't, 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 don't throw no line in the water. Don't put no bait on the hook. You sit there and influence fish. You know what people be saying? His cheese doesn't sit off the cracker. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's in trouble. Hey, listen. You got to speak. And I'm going to tell you something. God broke this preacher's heart, and God humbled me several years ago. I was preaching one Sunday night in Jacksonville, Florida, where I used to pastor, and I preached on soul winning. I preached on witnessing. Why everybody ought to be a witness. We had a little boy in our church. I say little boy. Dennis was mentally handicapped. Dennis was 26 years old. And Dennis would sit on the front seat of the church. We had theater seats in that church. And Dennis would sit on the front, and I would preach, and Dennis wouldn't say amen. Dennis would, yes! I'd preach, yes! Now, I loved it. It made the deacons nervous, but I loved it. <laughs> and, 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 and Dennis, I preached that Sunday night. And Dennis came to me and said, preacher... He said, can I go on visitation? We had visitation on Monday nights. I said, yes, you can, Dennis. He said, can I go with you? I said, yes. I got to church a little bit early that Monday night, and, and as I always do, and, and, and I looked down 44th Street, and I saw Dennis coming up 44th Street. Evidently, he had been to a yard sale and got him a new suit. I mean, that, 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 that sucker had plaids on it that big. I mean, he, he, he stood out, and he had a big white family Bible under his arm. He said, Preacher, I'm here. I said, I, I see you. <laughs> we had a couple that Sunday night in our church by the name of Gerald and Mickey Oldham. And Gerald and Mickey had signed a visitor's card, and they put on their visitor's card that, that they weren't saved. But they would, they would invite the pastor to come and visit in their home and talk to them about Jesus. I said, Tonight, Dennis, we're going to go down the Hexer Drive. We're going to visit Gerald and Mickey Oldham. And I did what I should not have done. I've apologized and I've repented over it. I said, Dennis, when we go on visitation, here's how we do it. One of us talks and one of us prays. Dennis, tonight, let me talk and you pray. 
Okay, preacher. We pulled up in front of Gerald and Mickey's house and down the Hexer Drive, and they were out on a, on a back patio, and they were grilling steaks. And they said, would you like to eat with us? They said, yes! <laughs> of course, I went along with it. <laughs> After we got through having dinner, we went and sat in the living room. And then Gerald was sitting there on one end of the couch, and Mickey beside of him, and Dennis was sitting down on the other end of the couch, and I was across from him in the chair. And I began to try to talk to Gerald and Mickey about the Lord Jesus. And folks, I want to tell you something. It was as though their hearts were of brass. I mean, I could not get through to them. There was a barrier, barrier, barricade there. All of a sudden, sitting down in the couch where Dennis was, I heard him sniffing, just sniffing his nose. I looked down, and the tears were running down his cheeks and dropping off his chin. And Gerald saw him and, and, and heard him, and, and Gerald looked down and said, Dennis, what's wrong? And Dennis, in a broken voice, said, Gerald, I don't know you, and, and, and you say that you've never been saved, and, and Gerald, I've never been on visitation before, and I don't know what to do. But Gerald, I just feel a, a burden for you to be saved. I've been saved, and Jesus can save you, Gerald. And all of a sudden, I saw Gerald and Mickey get off that couch and get on their knees. I heard them cry out to God, God, save me. God, I turn from my sins. I trust you. Please save me. And that night, they got saved by the grace of God. We rejoiced. We started back down Hector Drive, back to the church. And there sat little Dennis in the seat beside of me. I put my arm around him, and I began to weep. And I said, Dennis, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dennis, that I thought I was somebody, that God could use me and not use you. Please forgive me, Dennis. Preacher, I forgive you. That's the kind of guy he was. You see, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your education is. It does not matter. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be a witness for Him. You can be a witness for Him. The last thing Paul talks about here, and he talks about his, his witness here, he talks about the change in his life. He talks about the commission for his life. And then he talks about the Christ of his life. Down in verse 22, look what he says. He says, Having therefore obtained help of the God, I continue to stay witnessing, both to small and great, saying none other things than those things the prophets and the Moses the sayings should come, that Christ should suffer, and he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Look what Paul talked about. He talked about the change in his life. He talked about the commission of his life. And he talked about the Christ of his life. And notice what he said. He talked about the sufferings of Jesus. You see, people don't want to talk about that today. People don't want to know that they're suffering in life. And, and, and Paul said, I talked about the suffering of Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus Christ suffer? Jesus Christ suffered not for his sin, but Jesus Christ suffered for our sins. He suffered for you. He suffered for me that, that we could have life eternal and have life abundant. Jesus Christ paid our sin he talked about his suffering. But just like this morning, he talked about his sufficiency. That on the third day, he would raise from the dead. Now listen to me. If Jesus Christ is alive, and he is, if he could change Saul of Tarsus, he can change anybody. I believe that with all my heart. And the person you think they're not, that might be hopeless might be waiting for somebody to come and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. God might just be having you be that person. I close in this. My first church I pastored was in the mountains of eastern Kentucky. I'm a mountain preacher. I'm a mountain boy. I've raised in the mountains of eastern Kentucky. God saved me. I was working in the coal mines when God saved me. He called me to preach. First church I pastored, when I went there, they had 12 women and one man 
Now, I'm exaggerating the man part. <clears throat> he was 18 years old. He was a Sunday school superintendent. He was a song leader. And he was a bus driver. I had to fire him being a bus driver. He let a 12-year-old boy drive the bus one day, and he wrecked it, so I had to fire him. I went there to pastor that church, and, and, and for the first Sunday I was there, I didn't, I didn't want to go there. It was in my hometown. I didn't want to go there. I resisted going there. But the Holy Spirit wanted me to go there. God wanted me to go there. And they said, Pastor, if you'll come and be our, our pastor, we'll pay you $62.50 a week. I said, that's good. But I said, my wife and I have figured it up, and it takes us $80 a week to live before we buy groceries. And uh, if you can do that, I'll trust the Lord. You trust the Lord. I think he'll provide. They said, okay. The first Sunday night, we had 14 adult men saved in that church on the first Sunday. God just transformed that church. Well, one of our ladies in the church named Terry had a husband that lived up on a, the hill beside the church. And old Walt would never come to church, never come to church. So I made it a determination in my heart that I was going to witness the Waldo. And for two and a half years, every Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, I'd drive down, I'd park my car at the church, I'd walk up that hill, I'd knock on that door, and I'd say, Waldo, I've come to tell you about Jesus. I've come to invite you to church. He never came. Two and a half years. Every single Saturday. We were in revival at the church where I was pastoring. I was preaching it. That Saturday morning, I walked up that hill. I knocked on that door. I said, Waldo, I've come to tell you about Jesus. I'd invite you to church tonight to revival. He said, I'll be there. I got as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I mean, I could thread a sewing machine and run it. I got so nervous. Word got out in that little old community. Waldo Hammonds is going to church tonight. Well, the church packed out. People wanted to come and see what was going to happen. God, Waldo, come to church. I preached that night. The Holy Spirit moved in the service. I saw Waldo get up out of his seat. He walked in an aisle. And he gave me his hand. And he gave his heart to Jesus. He got saved that night. Waldo was a man's man. Six foot five, 265 pounds. I baptized him that following Sunday. The night I baptized him, I baptized 26 others with him. Waldo looked at me. We didn't have a baptistry. We had to go down the road and borrow the, the sister church's baptistry. We baptized the pond or the creek or wherever. I said, uh, Waldo said, Preacher, I want you to baptize me first. I said, Why, Waldo? He said, Well, you'll be so tired the time you baptize 25, you can't pick me up. <laughs> that makes sense to me. I baptized Waldo. About six months later, God called me away from that church. I remember the day I resigned. Waldo walked out the back door. I was shaking hands with people. He wouldn't, he wouldn't shake my hand. He turned his head. He walked up the hill. He never spoke to me. They had a little reception for me. He never came. It's been about eight years since that day happened. and I was getting up one morning, and my telephone rang about 5.30. I said, hello. He said, preacher. I recognized his voice. He said, Waldo. He said, preacher, he said, uh, I'm in a hospital up in Lexington, Kentucky. And they tell me I've got pancreatic cancer. I'm getting ready to go to surgery in about 40 minutes. And preacher, I knew there's anybody in this world that loved me, that you love me. I want to call you and ask you to pray for me. And by the way, preacher, I'm sorry for the way I acted. I was just hurt. I'm sorry. I said, Walt, I forgive you. I've already forgiven you. And I want to pray for you. I prayed for him on the phone. I said, Walto, I'll be to see you in a few days. A few days went into a couple of weeks and a couple of months. I was on my way to South Carolina to preach revival, and I made a point to swing by that church and swing by Walto's house and go back up on a hill one more time. I walked in his family room that I'd spent so many Sunday evenings there after church in. His wife probably fried enough green tomatoes to fill the back of my truck out there popcorn, and we had great times together. 
I walked in that family room and there was a hospital bed. And Waldo in that hospital bed. And he looked like skin stretched over bones. That man of a man was just so emaciated in his body. I walked over and hugged him and said, Walt, it's good to see you. He said, Preacher, it's good to see you. We talked for about two hours. Reminisced of old times where we'd go rabbit hunting together and bird hunting together and do all these things. And I said, Walt, I'd like to stay. But I've got to be down in Aiken, South Carolina tonight to preach revival. I've got to get on the road. They're expecting me to be there. He said, Preacher, I want you to preach my, my, my funeral. He said, I'm not going to be here long. I said, Walt, you're going to outlive me. No, Preacher, I'm serious. I want you to preach my funeral. Don't tell them about me. Don't talk about me. He said, you talk about Jesus. I said, okay, Walt. I had prayer with him. Knelt down over him. And he reached up and he hugged me. And he kissed me on the cheek. Here's something he said that I've never forgotten. He said, preacher, thank you. That you never quit coming. Thank you, preacher, that you never quit coming. Tell me about Jesus. You know what I've learned in 37 years being a pastor? There's a lot of Waldos out there. In fact, if I was a betting man, I'd bet you know one. It may not be a Waldo, but it might be a, a Linda or a Bob or a Sam or a Joe. There's somebody out there that you know that needs to know about Jesus. And you know what? They're just waiting for you to come and tell them about Jesus. Is he real? Sure he is. Has he changed your life? Have you got a job to do? Would you make every effort between now and tomorrow night to bring a lost friend with you to church? lost family member, that you'll go and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus. And folks, let me tell you, don't get on the guilt trip. You've not given the, been given the responsibility to save anybody. You can't save anybody. Your responsibility, my responsibility, is just to be a witness for the Lord Jesus.